Okay, we are going to um, change things around a little bit and do a one-on-one -on -one discussion now. We want to talk about NATO and cyber defense, and I'd like to call on to the stage Mr. Christian Liflander. He is with NATO. He's here today to talk to us about cyber defense. Mr. Liflander, come on the stage. It's good to have you with us. Take a seat right there. Uh, we appreciate you taking time. We know that um, we were afraid that the Lufthansa strike was going to keep you on the ground in Brussels today, but you did make it here with us today. I decided to go for Brussels Airlines. It's time. good for Brussels Airlines, exactly, that they were able to get you here. Um, we, we wanted you to come and talk to us about cyber defense, cyber attacks, um, the situation with, with, yeah, with cyber warfare um, and the way NATO sees it right now. So maybe you could um, start us off by just telling us um, how does NATO see the cyber situation, the cyber threat right now? Sure. Um, good morning, or rather good afternoon to all of you. It's already past 12 o'clock. Um, well, NATO has been in the security business for quite some time. I mean, we had the same mission of protecting the population of our, and the territories of our populations uh, during the Cold War. But um, things change. The world changes. Um, so when you look at uh, the mission, it has stayed the same. It is still the protection of the territories and the population of, of NATO territories. But in addition to you know, air, land, and uh, sea, and space, we now have this new dimension, the cyberspace. And consequently, NATO um, has been thinking also in, in how to ensure that this mission gets done in cyberspace. And really, when it comes to the, the latest thinking in this regard, you, you would have to take a look at the, the Wales uh, summit that took place last yeah. year. So there are three sort of key messages that I would like to share with you that actually came out of Wales, and then we can okay. sort of delve into the details later on. Um, first, I think, and that is that perhaps it, you know doesn't sort of make a splash, but it is important that when it when it comes to the conceptual thinking. How do we view cyberspace as such and our role in it? And and the very sort of a first key principle is that collective defense. You know, this is what NATO is all about. Um, also applies in cyberspace meaning that cyberspace is no different from um, the, the you know, air, land, and space, and, and sea. Meaning a cyber attack can also, be, can also result in the invocation of Article 5. Uh, similarly, allies recognize that international law applies in cyberspace, meaning this is not a wild west anymore, at least when it comes to the activities that really sort of cross the threshold and enter into the law of armed conflict. Mm -hmm. Um, so the question here now is, at least the way allies look at it, not whether um, international law applies, it does. The question is, how does it apply? But now, is NATO concerned um, about a nation state being an attacker um, when we're talking about cyber defense, or aren't you more concerned about a non-nation state actor being the one that actually launches an attack? Well, really, when you look out there, you know, the threat landscape contains all sorts of actors. You have uh, patriotic hackers, you have hacktivists that pursue their activities, you have organized crime that is really sort of focusing on, you know, the, the money issue, you know, just making profit uh, by just by using the cyber weapons, cyber tools, what have you. And in addition, uh, state actors as well, I would put it to you that say, state actors are perhaps the most potent ones out there, but you really shouldn't sort of disregard other actors as well. Sure. Um, so really when we look at it, I mean, the range of actors is really sort of uh, diverse. Okay. Um, but a second part, I mean, mm -hmm. even though we, we have this sort of concept, conceptual thinking in place, if you don't have capabilities, there's not a whole lot of use for that. Right. So I think, you know, the second push that you will see emerging in NATO is actually trying to sort of uh, strengthen the weakest link, if you will. It's not only about NATO, and NATO is a bit of a unique international organization in this sense. We have our own networks that span the globe, but also making sure that national networks, you know, our allies make, you know, do their homework and the national resilience is increased. And, you know, there are various tools that we're using, such as NATO defense planning process, in order to make sure that everybody's, you know, uh, is upping their game, so to speak, and is, is ready to sort of um, and play the ball. And, and last, but uh, certainly not least, is partnerships. Um, I'm sure many people on this stage have said that this is a cooperative effort, and indeed it is. So when we look at this field, we very much realize that NATO is but a player, one player among many in this global cyber ecosphere. I mean, there are other international organizations in addition to NATO. You have UN, you have OSCE, you have EU. Each one of them have their own mandates. And, you know, from NATO's point of view, we really would not want to duplicate the efforts that are ongoing. Take, for example, the... Um, 
the confidence building measures that are negotiated in MENA under the auspices of OSCE, for example. Mm. So we really see our role as complementary and really focusing on our core mission uh, rather than trying to be all things to different people. But when we talk about the partnerships, it's not only about, not only about uh, other international organizations, it's also partners. And you know, our partnership network really spans the globe. We have more, de more than 41 countries. Um, and last but not least, also industry. Well, I'm a boring diplomat. I'm sort of, I just use the technology. I don't develop it, if you will. Um, but private sector does. So this, you know, the key for us is going to be actually achieving these win-win relationships whereby we can actually use the technology that is being developed and hopefully actually contributing also to the industry's work. Do, do, you, at, do you guys at NATO, do you work with good hackers? I mean, because you've, you've talked about partnerships with industry, but what about hackers? Because they are the ones that, um, I, I know we've, we've talked a lot, and we're gonna, tomorrow we're going to have Kevin Mitnick on stage here, um, talking about the world of, of hacking and bad hackers turn good. Um, what about this notion of good hackers? Well, NATO's mandate really is defensive of nature. Uh, we do defense, we do not do offense, if you will, and just to put it you know, out there and, and to make it clear. However, at the same time, you have to recognize that, um, and this is quite often the case, that when it comes to actually understanding what is happening in the networks, you not only have to understand the defense, but you also have to understand what is it that is out there that is trying to get you. But there are different ways of actually, you know, sort of um, upping your game. And, you know, you can do vulnerability assessments, you can do, you can do penetration testing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, an important thing here to understand is that uh, also when we talk about NATO, it's quite often it's, it's the alliance. And we're not only talking about the NATO headquarters in, in the outskirts of Brussels. Right. It's also our member states. And when it comes to the member states, um, uh, I think, you know, a comparison to the conventional capabilities is quite adequate because NATO doesn't own its tanks, planes or ships. Allies do. These belong to the national uh, inventory. Similarly, when allies, I would imagine at the national level, look at this phenomenon, um, different allies, different countries will pursue this course in different ways. Of, of, for example, how do they benefit from the skill set? Uh, there are different approaches in this regard. I mean, I come from Estonia, for example. I'm an Estonian citizen, so Estonia is trying to tap into that resource yeah. uh, by having created the Cyber Defense League. So it's the voluntary uh, sort of war force that uh, would actually render its skills to the state's use if and when necessary. So I think the, the solution in this regard is not necessarily at the NATO, at the 28th level, rather that is with the member states. But you're going to have to rely on your biggest partners, uh, that obviously being the United States. L let's take Estonia as an example. Let's say that there is a cyber attack on Estonia's uh, power grid, for example, and, and the, the power is knocked out completely mm -hmm. in Estonia. And you, Article 5 is invoked. It is considered an attack on Estonia. You say you, you are defensive, but what do you do then? How do you act to defend Estonia if you're looking at it through the eyes of NATO? That's an interesting question. I mean, there are a couple of cases from the past that I think could serve as good examples. Um, first, in order to get to that Article 5 situation, uh, you would also, I mean, this would have to be a unanimous decision by the North Atlantic Council. All of the allies would have to recognize this as such. Do you, and do you think there would be any question of, of the allies recognizing that this, is, this has been an attack? Well, that's the thing. I mean, when it comes to the Article 5, there's no automaticity. Right. And there are no thresholds. It really comes down to, I'd put it to you, a, a political judgment call. Mm -hmm. uh, that needs to be made at one point by the council. But, I mean, uh, but do you think there would be room for discussion, though, about that? I mean, let's say if your entire power grid has been knocked out and, you know, the government of, of, of Estonia says we've been attacked, we've suffered a cyber attack, um, would there be any room for discussion? I mean, wouldn't Article, N5, Article 5 have to be invoked immediately? Not necessarily. I mean, and uh, quite an interesting comparison in this regard is what happened after the 9-11, because NATO really has invoked Article 5 only once in its history. Right. And that was the AWACS planes that we sent to patrol the skies over the North America. Yeah. And when you look at it, really, I mean, the, the means to respond uh, to that event, as well as the timing, really, you know, it, it wasn't dependent on the attack as such. I mean, it took some time for the, for the council to sort of make up its mind. And 
uh, the tool that was used was also, um, if I may use that word, asymmetrical. It mm -hmm. wasn't symmetrical. Sure. So similarly, when you look at the uh, attacks as such, or you know, the hypothetical scenario, I would imagine that there's still no automaticity, no threshold. But the response does, the response does not have to be immediate. It does not have to be symmetrical. Um, and it can take some time. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not necessarily sort of, you don't have to pin yourself down to the sort of immediate response, if you will. Do, do you feel that um, NATO is as prepared to uh, r respond to a cyber attack as it would be um, um, if there were a traditional armed attack? For example, if someone were to use missiles or a t traditional means of attacking, um, are you just as capable of responding if it's a cyber attack? Well, that's the thing. You're asking me a hypothetical, hypothetical question here. But, um, well, that's what you deal with, right? Absolutely. Until um, the real thing happens. Uh, true. Um, and here, I think an important thing to understand is that I think oh, you know, it, we have not tied ourselves to a specific response. So really, when it comes to time, place, and the, you know, the, the tool that would be used, um, you know, really the range is quite wide yeah. uh, in order to de-escalate the situation or to respond to that specific attack. Um, what is of, uh, quite interesting, in my opinion, is, for example, when you look at the, um, the attacks that actually took place against the Saudi Arabian refinery, Aramco, yeah. and there, you know, if you look at the case study, it was really, uh, it, it wasn't men in uniform, if you will, that responded. It was Microsoft that went and assisted right. uh, that recognition. And quite often, I think uh, this is also going to be a case where, you know, uh, if it's a national critical infrastructure that is attacked or, you know, that, and the stricken mm -hmm. uh, nation is asking for help. Uh, you would have to find that right skill set. You would have to find that specific uh, entity that is able to deal with uh, the very specific SCADA system that has been affected, for example. So really, when it comes to the response, and here, you know, going back to the, you know, the airline sea space uh, comparison, yeah. um, I I'd say also at NATO, we are really in the be you know, beginning of a longer conversation. Because we're, you know, we're doing our thinking, we're putting the policies in place, we're developing capabilities, but technology is racing ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, but now are you keeping up? I mean, we, we talked about this last year here, uh, about this conversation that's going on. And, and, and I, I just have to wonder, how much time do you have for these conversations? I mean, the, the ability to, for a cyber attack to be carried out is already there, right? So... It, don't you have to be prepared to deliver an answer immediately if an attack ha were to happen today? Well, I think we haven't seen all of it yet, uh, to be quite honest. The, the cases that uh, we have out there that have taken place, I would put it, you really haven't really crossed the threshold yet. Okay. Um, uh, time is of essence, essence, of course, and the negotiations would have to take place quite fast. But they do not necessarily have to reach the Article 4 or Article 5 level. Right. There's plenty of room for bilateral assistance. There's mm -hmm. plenty of room for multilateral assistance. Um, remember, quite often, I mean, the question that I'm asking myself quite often is, is there such a thing as a strategic toaster? Is there such a thing that, you know, a, a strategic fridge that you have to defend? And, you know, my answer would be no, certainly not. I mean, uh, everybody still has to have their national capabilities and the fire brigades in order but, to... I mean, that, that's a good question. It. What about a strategic um, refrigerator that has the bubonic plague in it, for example, at, at a lab and it's attacked? I mean, is that then a case for NATO? Well, I would leave it up to the wise people at the, at the North Atlantic Council to, to decide. Um, but... You know, you asked about the, the time. You had asked about you know, how much time do you have for consultation? Yeah. Um, and, and the time is a strange thing because when you, if you compare what is happening at cyber to another field that took about 30 years to figure out, that of, of the nuclear field, for example, yeah. um, the cyber conversation has really barely started. Um, and the capabilities that are currently developed or will be developed in the future, I think, will continue to challenge us. Uh, there are going to be some quite strange situations um, whereby a, a small attack that, for example, is, you know, if you're able to manipulate with a national data base, you're able to render the, sort of the trust in the government that the population has questionable. Um, thereby, you know, you have actually reached a strategic goal by rather small tactical means. So the questions, I think, is still out there. Um, uh, and in many ways, like I said, uh, it will be a political judgment call. However, much of it will also depend on consequences. Mm -hmm. um, it will be consequence driven. Um, not all attacks are equal uh, and not all consequences are equal. Um, and like I said, unfortunately the, or fortunately, there is no uh, Excel spreadsheet. It's, if you will, a constructive ambiguity in this 
situation uh, that NATO you know, prefers to still to have. Has it become more difficult for, for NATO um, to prepare for a, a, a cyber event in the post-Snowden, post-NSA environment? Um, I, I would assume that if you are gathering information um, about potential cyber hit, cyber attacks, you are using information, you're using surveillance information that may or may not put you in this gray zone of where you're actually obtaining data that some people could say would be, um, you know, going into an area where you're um, getting private information about people as part of your data collection or data mining schemes. Um, have you talked about that? I mean, has the preparation for a cyber event put you in, in a gray zone when it comes to respecting people's private information, private data? No, that's the, the short answer, but I'll give you a longer one as well. Yeah. Well, the, um, uh, this issue has not been discussed at NATO, so there is, you know, there is not a sort of a position that I can uh, sort of give mm -hmm. to you. Um, however, when you look at the structure of the alliance as such, we, you know, similarly to the, to the lack of NATO uh, you know, tanks, ships and planes, um, it's the same deal when it comes to the intelligence issue. Um, NATO really relies on its allies. Yeah, but what about if you were relying on NSA intelligence coming from your most powerful ally, the United States? If it is in the interest of a particular ally to share it with other allies, then absolutely it would, I'm sure it would do so. Um, for the time being, um, when it comes to our mission, uh, for example, you know, and the mission that we have first and foremost is defending NATO's networks, um, I think we're doing a pretty good job. Uh, we haven't really had um, an attack that you know, has been able to take down NATO services or the operational networks. These have stayed intact and we've been able to handle the DDoS and what have you um, rather routinely. Um, but of course, as time goes on, um, and you know you deal with the APTs and, and, and people get more out there get more sophisticated um, I would imagine that this will also put um, you know, more stress on these uh, in, in the intelligence gathering for example a way one way to sort of to solve it uh, for us and also to bring the industry into play because I'm aware that there are quite a lot of the industry players in the audience is that we're actually trying to you know enhance the information sharing so that it would not only be you know our nation states or you know member states that are in the game but also industry players because quite often um, you know, when you look at the information that is available out there in the networks, um, industry tends to have more of it than mm -hmm. uh, quite often than the, the states do. So really, it is, a, it is an equation where you, yes, you're dealing with uh, intelligence agencies, but at the same time, you're also dealing with industry players that also have a role to play. The, the situation with Russia right now um, and, and NATO, we know that um, there have Obviously, tensions have, are, have been increased. Um, tensions are higher than we've seen at any time since um, the end of the Cold War. Has the attention on the situation with Russia, has that distracted NATO from dealing with the cyber threat? Or has there been some, some marriage, if you will, of dealing with this new Russia threat and the cyber threat? Well, I wouldn't say it has distracted, uh, I would put it vice versa. It has sort of brought uh, cyber even more into the thinking of, of the alliance and then to the street, you know, strategic leaders. Because really, I mean, when you look at the events that have unfolded, um, and that quite often have been called hybrid warfare, then cyber is you know, quite a you know, quite prominent place, uh, you know, part and parcel of the hybrid warfare, so to speak. Um, so consequently, when we at NATO look at this phenomenon, I mean, we quite, you know, well realized that you have to deal with a range of capabilities right. whereby also sort of taking cyber bit into into account um, so it, it is it is it is certainly in the front and center but to be quite honest um, cyber is just you know when you look at you know the events that are occurring when you look at uh, what's out there it's like a constant hum you know a constant events that are you know, that are ongoing and consequently when, when it comes to cyber being discussed by the strategic leadership i would imagine that well, as has been the case in the past it will also continue to be in the future that it's, it is frequently uh, on the NAC table. Is, is, is cyber, cyber security or, or cyber threat, is, is that higher now in, in your, your scale of, of, of likelihood than just than a, a routine, or I should say routine, a, an attack with, um, with, let's say, tanks, with, with um, 
an Air Force or something like that? I mean, have you, or do you have a likelihood table that you put together at NATO now? Because some people could say, you're not going to be attacked by, uh, by an Air Force, but to be attacked um, in, in the cyber arena mm. is much more likely today. That, that's, that's what I'm trying to get at. Well, there's, there isn't a, a likelihood table as such, but I think Whale Summit was a, was yeah. a very, very good sort of a, a, a moment in, in space where, I mean, just by, by having said that, you know, a collective defense applies to cyberspace, I think that's as close to the likelihood as it gets. Yeah. Um, so when we look at the, you know, developing a range of capabilities, then we no, no longer, or, you know, if you will, you know, we do not really talk about the tanks, the flanging ships anymore. It's also the cyber bit that, that, you know, is increasingly as important as the conventional capabilities. Um, but it's easier said than done. Mm. Um, because, I mean, what I have noticed personally when I look at this issue is that it also tends to be quite abstract. Uh, how do you explain to your voters that, you know, we are 20% better protected? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an abstract issue. Um, so quite often what, what ends up happening is that you have these events that really sort of, you know, make people pause, make people sort of look at the issue at the national level quite often, and then to invest more money. Well, what makes you 20% better protected against a cyber attack? I mean, you can tell me we have, you know, a thousand more tanks or our conventional um, capability has increased 50%, for example. And we, we have an idea of what you're talking about. But when you're talking about cyber security, cyber defense, what does it mean when you say we're 20% safer today than we were last year? Well, that's the, that's the trick there isn't. I mean, if, if, you're, if you believe in that, it's an hallucination. So it's not possible to say that? I think whoever would make that statement would have to put some caveats to it. Okay. Um, because, you know, and once again, if I compare, for example, a cyber to a conventional capability development field, take, um, take airframes, for example. You develop an airframe and, you know, more than likely it would serve you for about 30, 40 years. You provided some upgrades to it and what have you, but it, essentially it was still the same piece of equipment. It's n not the case with cyber. I mean, okay. I mean, five years ago, the, one of the biggest uh, mobile phone uh, companies in the world was Nokia. Uh, it is no longer the case. So the, the, the pace is fast. And consequently, when you look at the cyber issue, I mean, quite often you have to realize that, you know, the, whoever is up to bad deeds might very well already be in your networks, mm -hmm. might already be uh, operating in your networks. So sort of the, uh, the part of the unknown. Uh, is quite difficult to measure. That's why I think the you know, giving percentage figures um, is elusive at best. I know one, th one area where we can talk um, very concretely with percentages, and that is um, defense spending among um, NATO members. I know at the Wealth Summit there was the promise made by all members that we will increase our spending on defense um, to meet our goals. The United States has pushed that. Um, that has not been the case, though. I know that there has been criticism recently that the, the French, the Germans, are not meeting the, the, the promises that, that they uh, made at the Wells Summit. How does that impact your ability to plan for an adequate and viable cyber defense when your members, such as Germany, are not walking the, the talk that they've made at a summit? Well, I'd leave the defense spending um, issue uh, aside and I would concentrate on the cyber piece. Well, to be quite honest, um, cyber doesn't really take that much of an investment. It doesn't break the bank. <clears throat> um, quite often when we look at this phenomenon, it is, uh, it is not that resource intensive. However, it, it is challenging politically and it is challenging organizationally. Sure. Um, so the challenge that, you know, that comes with cyber, uh, yes, on one hand, you have to invest. You, you have to sort of put in place necessary capabilities in order to understand what is going on in your networks and you know, to also to be able to respond. Um, but at the state level, quite often it is, it is not about the money. It is quite often about you know, being able to operate as a, you know, in a whole of government manner, uh, you know, having a clearly established lines of communication and roles and responsibilities so that everybody knows who's doing what, when, where and how, mm -hmm. uh, who is to respond. And um, you know, quite frankly, the same question about the strategic toaster, what is our pain threshold? Uh, how do we manage risk? Uh, nationwide, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, the message, at least when it comes to the cyber bit, is that it doesn't really break the bank. Okay. Um, and even during the times of austerity, I, I'd say that if you look into the future, it, it is a wise investment. 
yeah. uh, you know, that will only sort of bring invest, you know, return mm -hmm. in the future. I mean, uh, it is inevitable that you know, the exposure to the Internet of Things and the rest of it will only grow. I, I, we can't let you leave today with, without asking you um, about um, a guest that we will have later on today, and that's Edward Snowden. Um, what is, as, as a man from NATO, what's your opinion on Edward Snowden and the world that he has, based, has, he, that he has helped create with his revelations about the NSA? Well, the issue has not been discussed at NATO, so I mean, there's, you know, once again, there's nothing to tell here. Um, however, when... Is that, is, that, is that true, that it has, that issue has not been discussed at all at NATO? True. Um, but personally, when I look at it, and I'm sort of quite aware that um, the debate has started yeah. nationally in many capitals um, when it comes to the issue of mass surveillance, for example. Right. Um, and here, the uh, you know personally, once again, looking at this issue, I mean, there are two sides to this, two sides to this coin. On one hand, yes, there is the issue of privacy, but quite often, and you know, once again, personally speaking, I would advise that this not be done at the expense of security. So I think the key key thing here to uh, to achieve is is a good balance between the two principles, um, and that discussion will not be uh, taking place at NATO. It is, it is still driven by nations at the, at the national level and the questions that need to be asked and the answers need to be responded first yeah. and foremost at the national level. But, but, but what I'm interested in is NATO depends on the resources that its members can bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And that, that, of course, is the United States and that, of course, is the surveillance information that the NSA bring, can bring to the table. And if those efforts have to be have to be stopped or, or have, to, have to be pushed back because of, of a, a public uh, desire for those, desi for those actions to be curtailed. Doesn't that then come into the equation at NATO when you're talking about your ability to respond to cyber attacks? Well, that's one of the reasons why I made the point that, you know, the, the, you know, really do not forget the two principles. It's on one hand about privacy, but on the other hand, it's also about security. And the balance. Exactly. Okay. And the balance needs to be achieved because uh, I'm afraid that, well, the answer to that question, I think, will also change over time because of, you know, the technology and um, the change in technology and the implications that it will have in societies. However, um, erring on either side too much, I think, will, will create some problems. Um, and I would put it to you that at the end, um, you know, if it sort of, if you chip away too much of the security piece, uh, well, indeed, and then there, there's a price to pay at yeah. one point. Before we let you go, I know that last year and the year before that, the question was asked, um, has NATO been in kind of an identity crisis um, with the end of the Cold War? And now, of course, with this crisis with Russia, inside the walls of NATO, is maybe there an unspoken sigh of relief that we have this crisis because it's given NATO a, a renewed lease on life? I haven't seen many happy faces around. I think the faces are quite somber. So it's, in, in a sense, um, well, security has been our business for more than 60 years. Uh, it's in our, in our genes, if you will. Yeah. Um, now the, there's this new challenge. Um, not only that uh, that we see happening to the east of us, but also in the cyberspace. Yeah. Um, so I think in many ways, uh, it is about you know, sort of changing gears. And, and having to sort of come to, not only come to grips, but also preparing for the future. Okay. Um, I, I'm not necessarily happy about it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that can be your quote, right? But, but you do have to admit, before the Russia crisis, there was this talk. I mean, I talked with this about with Jamie Shea as well. There was this, this talk, at least in the public sphere, that NATO was kind of searching for a reason to continue on. Um, but we don't talk about that anymore. Well, what we're talking about is actually making sure that the populations are protected. Yeah. Um, and the 900 million people that live um, in the North Atlantic Treaty area under this umbrella, if you will, uh, they need to be protected. And this is the first, you know, first and foremost, the mission that we have. Good. Mr. Liflander, thank you very much for talking with us today. Brent, Appreciate thank you. It. Let's give him a hand, everybody. Thank you very much.